Welcome to the Agora Podcast. My name is Penguin, and I'm here with my usual co-host, Sekhma Agora. We're here to talk about our usual topics of uh, agorism, localism, decentralization, and anti-authoritarian ideas. Um, today, we have a very special guest, Shane, from Bonnie Podcast, uh, joining us to talk about, uh, join us from Homestead, to talk about various topics. Um, this should be really interesting. A discussion on personal liberation and um, and various ideas that are um, really topical to our podcast. Uh, so I did want to bring up some uh, recent events that are uh, pretty troubling. Um, so it's it's come to my attention, you know, that they had happened that there was a raid on some of the uh, key New Hampshire libertarian activists, uh, peace and cryptocurrency activists. Uh, connected with the, uh, the Shire Free Church and the uh, Free Keen, uh community in New Hampshire, part of the um, New Hampshire Liberty Migration. They were uh, raided by federal authorities in cooperation with, uh, well, I should say, uh, state security services, uh, services from the federal level, the local police and such. They, uh, you know, I think No Knock raided them from what I understand. I don't have all the full details. This isn't some kind of official account here, but from what I heard um, from people on the ground into social media, it was no knock raid. They seized, um, I, I think, about two dozen firearms. They obviously, you know, ransacked the place, went through everybody's possessions, including you know, the number of people that lived there that are not, um, they have not been kidnapped and caged, but they did, they did take, um, take away uh, Ian Freeman. Um, of the Libertarian Radio Show, Free Talk Live, um, uh, Arietta Mezzo, um, the nobody who ran for governor in uh, New Hampshire, and uh, uh, three other individuals. Um, I think they raided some other locations as well. Um, they're big into uh, cryptocurrency activism, and spreading cryptocurrency, and um, engaging in commerce um, very publicly and. Um, very zealously uh, with uh, blockchain assets and cryptocurrency, and you know, um, from the libertarian, from the libertarian standpoint of uh, free money, free and competitive money, and it's also open source. And we'd love to have a show on crypto one day, but it's very troubling. These uh, folks have been kidnapped and caged and face uh, very, very serious charges. That I, I do think that some of them are still. Um, are being caged, not out on bail, up in uh, New Hampshire. So our thoughts with them, uh, and I think this could come up. I mean, obviously there was there's an issue of uh, when we are in the public spotlight and we are, you know, out in the open. And the Gore is open, actually. I believe that's etymologically tied with the world. We are open. We are vulnerable, and um, that really ties into our topic of uh, personal liberation and Vanu. And said, why don't you introduce our guests and the um, basics of the topics of uh, Vanu and, and related stuff? So, uh, hi, this is Sek from Appalachia. Um, <clears throat> the guest we have today is somebody that I have listened to for uh, quite some time. This podcast is quite valuable. It's um, based more around strategy and what things you can do in the here and now. And I find that quite valuable. Um, speaking in terms of strategy, I think that I said to you is if, if you're, you're going to be very loud and vocal like the people in Keen are, <clears throat> you be, better make sure you're you're clean. And if you're going to be doing dirt, for lack of a better term, you better not, you know, vocalize and draw attention to yourself. You can't have it both ways. And to be loud and vocal about these things and also be doing uh, activities that some state thugs might not like, um, is at the same time, this is probably not a very wise strategy. So today we've got Shane with us to talk about um, Vanu, um, temporary autonomous zones, and the second realm. <clears throat> all um, topics um, that are they're based around strategy and personal liberation. Um, and 
as a concept, these are not necessarily new. Um, this, these kind of go back to Josiah Warren's intentional communities and that kind of thing. They're, they're more modern spins on some, some older concepts. Um, Shane, if you want to say a few words about um, what's going on in Keene and, and what you've been up to these days. Sure, sure. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely definitely unfortunate to uh, unfortunate to hear. And, yeah, I, I saw that, that news come across uh, Telegram for me um, the day of. But uh, really, it's, uh, yeah, as you say, the, 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 the biggest challenge that we face as people who care about freedom is how do we interact with the servile society, the first realm? Um, you know, these coercive, you know, this uh, coercive society that would love to toss us in cages if they you know, had the opportunity to, right? So how do we interact with, uh, with the servile society? Well, um, the free keen folks, as you said, they've been very, very out, out and open about it. Um, they went to, they, they pursued the legal interstices, um, as Rayo called it, that, that's sort of the strategy, legal loopholes. Um, they had, you know, um, Shire Free Church Incorporated, I guess, like they, their, their names were, their, their, uh, you know, their given government names were on, you know, the leases of things. They went the, the legal route about it. And, um, that's, that's one way to, one way to go. Um, it's not the, not the, the route that I prefer because you're basically handing yourself to the state on a golden platter. Um, and, uh, I guess just to add a little more context to it, it seems like, and obviously there's still, you know, uh, still details unknown and I haven't kept up with it over the past few days, but I, I think they, the, 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 uh, the idea, or I guess the, the main idea is that it's, it's due to the, the Bitcoin AT, Bitcoin AT that was there. And I guess Treasury might, have, might have been involved. I saw some report of that, but again, this is all kind of just, um, not official news reports. Don't take it for, for fact that look it up and, and follow up, follow up yourself. But, um, yeah, it really just comes down to how, how we interact with the, the survival society in the first realm. Um, they, they went the, the legal route, and uh, the other route, which is more, I guess you could say, in, in, ter- uh, in terms of the, the second realm strategy, um, is uh, you know the, pro- uh, the proxy merchant role. Um, basically, an entrepreneur specialized in uh, interaction between the first and the second realm. So um, we can talk more about that later, but really, it's uh, um, we're talking about strategy, and uh, there's the, the more kind of covert route, um, and there's the more out and uh, open about uh, open routes. Um, there are benefits and drawbacks to both. Um, benefits they probably reach you know they reach a lot of people there uh, in Keen and uh, you know um, widely. I don't know how beneficial that is with um, with you know folks not being able to think very, very very you know very well with all the programming and brainwashing. But um, at the same time, you know they they reach a lot of people. That's one benefit. But the the, the downs the major downside is yeah they they, they make themselves very vulnerable to the coercion of the state. Um, so yeah, diff- I guess difference in strategy. I, I approach things uh, more from, uh, as you were saying, the Vonu angle, um, which is uh, definitely more trying to remain in- remain invisible to the coercers, um, rather than confronting openly, which is more kind of the approach the free keeners have taken over the years. Um, but uh, I guess that's kind of my my brief initial over uh, my initial overview on on kind of what I what I see with that situation. And uh, I guess just to, to close it out, it's it's another instance of chilling dissent. Um, unfortunately, you know, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, open source technology in general. It's very, very, um, you know, for people who understand um, this technology, um, which we've covered it for, for, you know, many, many episodes on the Vani podcast, uh, people who understand the value and value of this technology, uh, it makes sense why, like, uh, you know, the state would be coming, you know, coming after it, why they would try to chill, chill said dissent. And uh, you've got to, you've got to believe that, you know, a lot of those more straight and, you know, straight and, um, I guess, more white markets, uh, businesses there in Keene and New Hampshire, um, when more stories of this come down. Um, you know, people getting hammered for their Bitcoin ATMs or whatever. It's gonna. It's there's a lot of folks that are just not going to use the technology because of that alone. So um, it's not surprising to see it all. Um, obviously, not good, but um, yeah, this is uh, this is the world we live in. And uh, to, to kind of close that before I turn it over to you, Vaughn, it was based upon reality, not legality. So um, it's uh, this is the nature of the situation we face, and we we adapt accordingly. So yeah, that's uh, I guess just a brief introduction. So Shane, now. I agree with what you said, and I find um, that, you know, being very loud and vocal can be a valuable strategy uh, for our own goals. Now, it's, it's not for me either. I'd rather be much more covert, but somebody has to do it, and I, I kind of value somebody at least yelling it from the rooftops to maybe draw attention. But you can't do both at the same time. Sure. If, if you're going to be very loud and vocal and in the uh, face of the state, you really have to make sure your ducks are in a row all your I's and T's are crossed, and there's nothing that they can nail you for. You can't be, you know, right? You know, whatever, selling weed and also being very loud on a radio show. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? So if you're going yeah. to engage in gray market and find new activity, you can't also be very loud. Right. Uh, you have to you have to pick between the two strategies. And um, again, that's not necessarily for for me, but. Um, 
you know, it really is a shame to see it happen to him, you know, but, uh, you know, lessons learned here, you know, what, what, what can we learn? Um, to, um, so, so Banu, um, Banu is, stands for voluntary, not vulnerable. And from what I understand, essentially from listening to you for years is it's, it's strategies and tactics, um, to remove yourself from any, anyone who would impose coercion upon you, um, whether that's the state, um, or, you know, thugs that, local thugs or whoever that may be. What, what are some examples of this? Sure, sure. And, uh, I'm glad you, I'm glad you put it that way because that really was, in my opinion, um, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of things. Uh, the, the founder of this freedom strategy, Banu, uh, is just, he went uh, pseudonymously by, by the name of Rayo. And, um, you know, his, he was very, very forward thinking in a lot of ways. But one of them was the recognition, um, that it's not only, um, it's not only, pri- you know, p- uh, public coercion like the state, um, that is dangerous. It's also, you know, private, you know, um, you know private coercion, um, corporations, uh, uh, you know, big, you know, big multinational corporations, uh, um, you know, the, the local, the local, uh, you know, rapist, thief, murderer, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, so he was very, very much, uh, um, very much, I guess, pointing that out too, that it's, it's public and private. But, uh, um, yeah, as, as far as uh, potential strategies and lifestyle changes, uh, Rayo, Rayo talked about quite a few uh, for him personally. Um, he began as a uh, as a van nomad. He uh, moved out of his uh, out of his uh, camper into a uh, van. Uh, uh, yeah, he moved out of his uh, apartment into a camper mounted on a pickup truck, and uh, he pursued. Uh, he lived uh, mostly in uh, you know so called public lands um, out there in uh, out out west, and uh, really just moved around a lot, and uh, you know found some uh, invulnerability to coercion that he was seeking, but it wasn't enough for him. Um, so he he went. Uh, he was he was very very radical individual, um, and uh, he actually decided to pursue wilderness fauna, which again this is most. This is the most radical route. Uh, keep in mind, Bonnie was yours for the making. So if this doesn't appeal to you, don't just turn yourself off of Bonnie just for this reason. This is this was his route in particular. But uh, he prepared to build on his Bonnie, which entailed uh, living in a polyethylene A tent. It's not any, it's just plastic tent out in the Siskiyou National Forest. He called it the Siskiyou region, and uh, it's northern California, southern Oregon. Um, so uh, yeah, that was uh, those were those are two bunch of strategies. Um, uh, I guess uh, van nomadism is a lot more popular than the wilderness fawny one, but uh, nonetheless, they're they're both available. Um, I guess uh, another one that so, uh, we're, oh, go ahead. Oh, so I just wanted to kind of delve into that. So the the key thing being there is mo- being mobile, yeah. so or being very very anonymous in the middle of nowhere, in the hopes that by being um, mobile. Um, you don't draw attention to the state. You have less interactions with the state. Being out in the wilderness, you have you just by the nature of the beast, you have far less interactions with anyone except for maybe bears. Um, so that's kind of the idea behind the, the van nomadism and the uh, you know the wilderness living. Right. Yes. Right? Yes. And 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 uh, you know I'll, I'll name mm-hmm. a few more strategies as we go through this. But yeah, you'll you'll notice the theme. The theme sure. of most of these is mobility. Um, and uh, Ray was very, very, you know, upfront about that too. If the coercers can't find you, they can't coerce you. Um, so if you're always on the move, if you're always in a different country, if you're always um, in, uh, you know, some national forest, um, then they're going to have a really, really hard time finding you um, to inflict that coercion. And then you, you go further, further than that, and and uh, talk about, you know, pseudonymity and uh, other security culture practices. And uh, you can, I mean, uh, at least back in back in his day, it was very, very. I'd say it was, uh, it wasn't hard to just completely disappear. Um, if you, you know, did, did it the right way and he was, he definitely knew the, I guess the, the right way to do it. But, uh, yes, you're, you're, you're very right to point that out. Um, uh, mobility is, uh, is important here for sure. Okay. You know what? It kind of strikes me as almost a, a, a primitivism, the, the mobility aspect because, uh, you know, really, uh, human beings in, in a, um, kind of, kind of a Neolithic time before, you know, they were, you lived in a region, you lived in probably like a forest, actually. I mean, it was, it was very much, uh, you lived. You had a, a range like any other creature, and uh, in, in even primitive agriculture was possible. It's only when you start. It's only when humanity started, you know, uh, planting grains and other um, grains and, and other similar crops that you know, the permanent settlements and uh, there and then the coercers. I mean, that from what I understand, state formation, at least the theory of state formation, is that uh, coercers, uh, whoever that may be, have the ability to not account you, control you, tax you, um, mm-hmm. keep tabs on you and such uh, from that point that's on. That's an interesting so just, line to draw. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's okay. what I'm thinking yeah, when I hear that. Actually, um, that's James C. Scott's argument 
Yep. And that being sedentary or uh, stationary is what allows for the state to uh, coerce you and to form in general. Um, so that's interesting that that was simultaneously, you know, Rayo's strategy was to stay mobile, much like, you know, the, the barbarians in the, in, you know, in the old days. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, um, what, what else was there anything else he, um, thought of as, you know, strategy? So it's essentially, um, a security culture, right? And it's, it's tactics and strategies, um, to, uh, avoid conflict essentially or to uh, mitigate conflict with uh, whoever that may be. Sure, sure. And, and I can provide a... Right. Uh, and, and we... Uh, yep. uh, sorry. Um, I had... Well, I guess... Okay, there we go. Um, still, yeah, excellently muted myself. But uh, yeah, I guess I can provide just some more... Um, we like to, we really like to start with definitions on the Vanu, on the Vanu podcast, so I can just do that real quick sure. um, for the benefit of your audience. Um, so Vanu is... And this well, is definitions. More, um, this is more of the uh, the Vanu textbook definition, but Vanu is a condition or quality of, as well as the action of achieving an invulnerability to coercion. Um, now, you mentioned uh, voluntary, not vulnerable. Um, Vanu is an awkward contraction of that. And uh, practically speaking, you know, practical definition, it's the adoption of lifestyle changes in pursuance of said invulnerability to coercion. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we covered some of the, I guess, the... Um, the mobility ones. Uh, another another related strategy there that is, is worth mentioning. I said, you know, if, if you're not even in the same country, um, there's a strategy called perpetual traveling. And uh, there are folks that um, not only do they not have a particular region like you were talking about, like uh, you know maybe a small hunter gatherer region. Well, they they don't even ha- they don't have a, a home base like that at all. They just you know ping around between um, you know a few hand- a three you know a few or a handful of countries they like. They they, they find. Uh, um, you know, beneficial for, you know, tax or entrepreneurial reasons, whatever, whatever they decide to do. The, f- the five flag theory comes into play here. Um, there's a, um, so that's, a, that's more of a, an international mobility strategy, but, uh, but one that, that's some, that's some prefer. And, uh, um, you've, you've got a lot of options. Uh, you've got a lot of options, a lot of flexibility in that realm. And, uh, I will mention, um, today I, p- I posted about him in the, uh, Pasnia Telegram, um, channels, but, uh, there's actually ways now, um, you can, you can, like, <laughs> you can buy, you can buy, um, passports, and uh, basically citizenship with with Bitcoin. Um, so like there are, there are like there are international travel ways opening up within kind of the great I guess you could say kind of the gray market. So there's there's lots of interesting things happening um, in that area. Something I'm I'm kind of paying attention to because um, you know it's it's uh, all, you have to prepare for every eventuality, right? And the the, the eventuality that you see with the state is uh, is uh, violence and coercion. So obviously if uh, um, anyone you know comes into contact with that, you know the the best idea is to leave and um, you know. Rather than uh, you know try to fight it, um, fighting it uh, doesn't uh, <laughs> doesn't really bode well with unlimited resources and uh, um, you know seemingly unlimited resources and uh, and it uh, you know fake money. But uh, anyway, um, so yeah, perpetual and, travel, and endless uh, and endless soldiers to throw at you. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, so yeah. something. All right. So something I thought of that I haven't heard you guys talk about. But um, it seems to be maybe intuitive, and it seems to fall in line with Vanu. But this would be things like uh, self-reliance and you know personal homesteading. Yes, you're not mobile, and yes, you ha- you have a geographic location to where uh, the coursers can find you. But things like you know um, homesteading and prepping, and you know. Um, you know, learning based first aid skill, uh, skill shares, that kind of thing would all kind of fall under this because you're preventing, you're building yourself up as to become less vulnerable to the state and coercion and the state's, um, you know, the state's corporate structure and that kind of thing. Um, so it's not something I've, I don't, I don't know if I've heard you guys talk about much, but I would think that would, um, fall on, under Vanu strategy or is it, is it strictly being mobile? So, sure. So, um, so there's not. I mean, it's you know, Vanu is a created thing anyway. Um, and and you know, as as I as I've said, and as Ron, as Rayo said, Vanu is years for the making. So like, there's no, um, there's no bookends here. Like it's it's whatever 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 you think of, whatever is relevant. A hundred years, I can't foresee what that what that's going to be. Um, whatever whatever that lifestyle change is, it makes people invulnerable to the courses at that time. Um, is uh, is is Vanu, but. Um, no, it certainly isn't relegated to just just mobile, just uh, you know mo- uh, mobility. That was that was what Rayo favored, and um, there are many many advantages to, mo- to, to to mobile lifestyles. But um, you're correct. Uh, you know, it's it's all about benefits and drawbacks, and there are a lot of advantages to being to being more stationary, um, like on an off grid homestead. Um, I've got a 22 acre homestead here in uh, 
in Southern Illinois and what I've been in the Free Republic of Pasnia. And um, yeah, you know, I, I, I've, it's, it's been incredible to see just over the past year, um, without really knowing much of, of what I'm doing, um, you know, how, uh, like with, with food self-sufficiency, for example, um, you know, cutting ties to the state, um, cutting ties to that, that society that allows the, the state to exist and, and to, to come into existence in the first place, um, you know, being able to have food independence, being able to grow your own, you know, medicine, for example, you know, plant medicine, um, you know, being able to, you know, uh, um, you know, even more kind of an entrepreneurial role. Um, there's a wide open market for duck eggs and ducklings here where I am. Um, there's a wide open market for, you know, turkey eggs, wide open, you know, wide open market nice. for a lot of things. Um, so like there's, there's a lot of opportunity in that area, in, in that realm too. Um, uh, so yeah, there it's, it's just benefits and drawbacks. And, uh, Rayo penned something back in, in the 1960s that he called mean time to harassment. And the idea is the longer, uh, the longer between interactions you have with coercers, the higher the mean, your mean time to harassment. Um, so he would say, for example, and this is just going to be a rough, rough idea, but, um, say you have one interaction with the bludgies with the police, um, as a van nomad a year. So that your mean time to harassment would be, you know, one, um, and so let's say, you know, for a, for a, I don't know, maybe your city of a new one. Uh, maybe you live in a, in a city and that's the best that you can do, but you, you try to be as vulnerable as you can. Um, and your mean time to harassment is once every two months or something like that. Then your mean time to harassment would be, would be lower. So, um, yeah, it really just comes down to, uh, you know, um, being very aware of, uh, of, uh, you know, the options available to you and, uh, um, you know, what you, what you want, because it, it is, it is a choice too. I mean, uh, um, it would be, it would be great, um, you know, to be super, super invulnerable to coercion, kind of just live, live, you know, um, like Ray, Ray had a lot of, I would say that Rail had a lot of invulnerability out in the middle of the forest. There aren't, there's not a lot of people going out there, not a lot of people to coerce him other than, you know, just nature, um, which I don't really consider that coercion. Um, so yeah, you, you could have a really, really high mean time to harass me, but what are you sacrificing? You're sacrificing, um, you know, a, uh, an agora, you're sacrificing a liberated, you know, a liberated, you know, um, culture or community you're missing. Um, you know, maybe, um, some, uh, some high quality, Regular you know, hot really, showers. Yeah, re- yeah, that really good, really good food that you grow, lo- that you grow yourself. I mean, there's, there's, there's benefits, benefits and drawbacks to everything. Um, so, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. Um, I'm definitely with you. I think, um, you know, <laughs> um, got to start, I mean, there's, there's not really a choice anymore. I've got, got to start. I mean, last year, people, last year was when I really, really, really hammered down on the homestead, um, myself, but, uh, yeah, it's, things can happen, oh, but things can happen but you know what are we going to do are we just not going to survive in the meantime like no i'm, I'm not just going to survive here i'm going to thrive and we're going to do as uh, as, as well as we possibly can so um okay so, you, you mentioned uh yeah you mentioned um something just, uh, a while ago the uh, first realm in the second realm i've heard sure. um you know so a couple times uh set has brought the term second realm up um, what's, what's that referring to? I, I, I take it that the first realm is, is the kind of the basic, uh, world we live in, kind of in the, in the state, statist, uh, matrix. Correct. Yep. I, I can provide those definitions too. And yeah, so, so servile society and first realm are synonymous terms. Um, that was Rayo's term in the 1960s and second realm, uh, or I guess the, 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 the second realm ter- terminology was just updated in, I think, 2013, um, uh, by, uh, by, by smuggler and XYZ. But yeah, the first realm is, a society that does not respect self-ownership or individual liberty, rather heraldic the supremacy of government and authority, uh, it upholds the collective as superior to the individual. So it's, uh, you know, the reason, what I, I'm, I presume one reason why you guys do your podcast is, is uh, you know, that that's, uh, you know, coercion, that authoritarianism. Um, yeah, that's, uh, you know, why why people listen to it. It's why, why people pursue agorism in, in general is, 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 is for, for that reason. So um, we're, we're all familiar with that. The first realm is survival society. That's what we're talking about. Um, in the second realm, um, the best definition I found is actually from a, a crypto agorist novella called Hashtag Agora. Um, and they, uh, uh, they de- the author of that defines the second realm as, quote, technically the second realm is described as encrypted communication, encrypted currencies, anonymous and pseudonymous identities, and untraceable action, uh, end quote. And uh, I guess another way to, to, to conceptualize the second realm is, um, so the Agora is, you know, uh, more of kind of a focus on economics, right? Um, well, the second realm is uh, expanding the agora to include living situation. You're talking about off-grid homesteading, you know, off-grid intentional community, um, a liberated culture, um, which is also, you know, very, very important. Um, and even beyond that, which I think is kind of the focus right now, um, or what, what is, uh, I think, a really, really important focus is our own infrastructure. Um, being reliant upon, you know, the, the electrical grid, um, the centralized electrical grid is not a wise decision, especially if it gets cold where you are in winter or something like that. Um, so, you know, things like off-grid electricity, uh, mesh networking for... Uh, you know, ways around the, the centralized uh, censorship-happy, uh, you know, platforms, um, et cetera. 
and um, just, I guess, in general, incorporating other security culture and bonding principles. So um, you, you were saying earlier on in the podcast that, um, you know, this relies heavily on, you know, Josiah Warren's uh, intentional communities. Well, you know, the second realm is really just, the second realm ends, I guess, my, the way that I describe and, and, and kind of live, live on you is just a mishmash of, like, the best strategies that I've, that I've come around to. It's not that one's any better than, better than the other. It's just that the second realm um, combines all of these things that are really, really incredible. Um, so, yeah, that was a good to point out, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you guys there to see, see where, you want, where you want to go from here. Yeah, it, it seems like all of these people are pointing at the same thing or in the same direction, whether it's Josiah Warren or Samuel Konkin or Rayo, with, with different emphasis on, on, on different things and different yep. strategies to essentially achieve the same or similar goals. Mm-hmm. So the second round seems almost like an update between uh, Rayo, Konkin, and, well, temporary autonomous zones, mm-hmm. which we'll go into in a bit, but kind of uh, updated for the, the 21st century uh, with a combination of, you know, digital security culture and cryptography and that kind of thing. So it's, right. it almost seems to uh, be a pinnacle at our point in time of all the previous ideas that have come before Right, and and, and, I, and I should I should an emphasize assessment? yeah, yeah, and I should emphasize that too. Like when it comes to the second realm, um, we're not just talking about phys- in physical space and time. Um, we're also talking digitally, as right. you said. So um, cryptocurrencies, um, you know, encrypted, uh, you know, encrypted deep web chat rooms, um, you know, uh, um, websites on IPFS, internet, internet, uh, internet interplanetary planetary file storage. Um, you know, any of these things would be digital second realms. Um, Open Bazaar, BISC, these, uh, um, these. Uh, um, commerce platforms, whether for, for products or services or uh, cryptocurrencies, um, these would all be digital second realms. Um, so yeah, the idea is, is to build these pockets of freedom. It's not it's not about you know trying to wait around for a free society or for people to understand the ideas of freedom. It's um, we want to live in, we want to live this we want to live in freedom now. We want to live according to our principles of non coercion, which is very very hard to do. Um, it's impo- I mean, it's possible to live in this rebel society, right? Like you have to, I mean, um, you know, whatever whatever you do, um, even if, even inadvertently, it's just uh, you know the coercion is everywhere. So, um, in order to 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 live our principles now, we, we have to build these pockets of freedom, um, whether in the digital space um, or I or I'd say both, um, both in physical and um, in the physical and digital realm. So yes, um, very very good to point. Peglin, did you have a question? Uh, no, no, that was pretty good. Um, the only thing I can say is, um, and this is kind of going back to, to the mobility thing, um, you know, I, I totally get the mobility thing. Clearly, I clearly I get it and, and support it and, and see how it's useful in the historical context and all that. The only thing um, I would say is that, and a lot of times, for example, traveling between places, traveling between, first of all, traveling between countries, that always puts you at these choke mm-hmm. points where the, the, the authority, so-called authorities control, and it seems to be, it, 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 in, in modern terms, I mean, there was a time, yes, when you could just, the, the, this, uh, the capacity for surveillance and information gathering and sharing wasn't wasn't there just te- technologically, but actually it, it kind of makes you a lot more legible moving between spaces. And in, in, in general, transitional spaces in general have been, are, are really some of the most um, monitors. So like when you're traveling, when you're on the road, just legally and the presence of all sorts of um, moder- monitoring devices and stuff on the roadways and in different forms of transport kind of, seems to, you know, the technology is kind of kind of in a way where I think uh, maybe there's a recognition that that's the that mobility is kind of where people are um, are less vulnerable in, in authorities have kind of um, moved technologically to catch up. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's definitely a fair point. And even back in the 60s, uh, you know, Rayo said, and I'm just paraphrasing, he said, you know, motor- motorized nomadism is not a panacea. Um, you know, he the, the reason he, um, you know, even back in the 60s, um, the reason he, uh, one of, I guess, a couple of the reasons he pursued wilderness fauna was the reliance upon slave tags like driver's license and registration, uh, et cetera. And um, just the, the fact that when you, it requires travel on so-called public roads, and if you're on so-called public roads, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you, you put yourself at risk, and especially if you have an out-of-state license plate, you, you know they love to hit people like that, so... Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, there's no, there's no real optimal lifestyle. Um, honestly, uh, it really just comes down to, um, the individual and what, what position they're in, uh, if they're, you know, single, sl- single versus family. Um, it really, really does come down to that, that individual position and, uh, you know, what's, what's, what's possible. 
um, because there there's some things that just aren't possible for for, for folks. Um, and uh, you know, Vani, Rayo, we, we I mean, um, cer- certainly certainly recognize that. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you you bring up a good point. I guess that's another reason why I, I I've seen a lot uh, personally, and this is kind of my focus too, is um, you know, building these second realms in, in physical space and time, and then also more overarching network. Because um, there, there's a lot of them out there, but there's just not a lot of uh, you know interaction and, and I guess uh, um, I guess uh, I guess coordination. So that's uh, that's where it's lacking, and uh, um, that's kind of where where, where my focus is, is going to be over this year is kind of bring, bringing those together. But um, yeah, it's just come down to after after last year, if uh, you're someone who cares about freedom or don't want to um, you know cover up your face and not be able to breathe. Um, then, I mean, uh, in some places, you can't be a part of that society. Some people just don't have that choice anymore. And personally, I don't want to be a part of that society just because it's it's based off coercion. It's, uh, in my opinion, immoral and ethical and all those things. And I don't want to be a part of it. Um, well, there, there are some folks last year that just kind of, they, they got forced out. Um, you know, they, they, they got forced out. They kind of saw through, saw through uh, um, you know, what was, uh, um, you know, what was going on. And uh, they, they decided to pursue their um, it, it, it's it's it, it kind of it kind of stopped being a choice is, is what I'm getting at. So um, the the van is uh, um, it's uh, it's an intermediate lifestyle I would say. Um, that's kind of how Rayo Rayo pointed out too. It's um, you know if if you need to get out quick, it's a very low. You very, it's getting a van and convert getting a van or getting a car to live in very very you know low investment capital to begin with. And um, you know if you if you if you if your life's at risk uh, and you need to hit the road, I think it's uh, certainly a um, a good alternative to have, but uh, yeah, you're, you're right. There's there's no real optimal lifestyle. The state is uh, um, the technocracy is growing. Surveillance state's uh, been here for for some time, and uh, really, it's uh, yeah, um, just uh, doing what we can. Well, despite, that's the one good thing facing. about yeah. Well, that's the one good thing about these concepts is they're highly individualized. So it, it entirely depends on your own you know risk versus benefit analysis mm-hmm. and your own preferences and your um, goals and lifestyle and, you know, get variables in your own life that you have to come to your own decision. There is no one answer for, for everyone. And these, um, these concepts allow for a lot of, uh, you know, imagination and innovation and, um, fitting, fitting, um, fitting it into your, your own life. Um, you know, and, uh, it's more of a way of looking at things versus, um, you know, a, a concrete set of strategies, you know, it's, it, it's a different perspective. Uh, but um, you, you're right. I think um, the second realm, there's a lot of people that are just back to the land has been popular for a long time. People mm-hmm. just leaving society and heading out into the country and, you know, setting up homesteads and that kind of thing. Um, second realms, you, you're right there. Uh, there's more and more of, you know, these kind of little spots, but it's necessary to get more uh, interaction mm-hmm. between. So to, to build these out horizontally, um, in addition to little being little pockets. Mm-hmm. So to do that, I think we need um, what, what you mentioned before, what's called a proxy merchant. Could you, can you define that for us? Sure, sure. So uh, a proxy merchant is uh, really just an individual or an entrepreneur specialized in facilitating trade or interaction with the, with the first realm of the Servile Society. Um, so this would be somebody, um, for example, like uh, um, a, 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 a someone who, who sells cryptocurrency for, for fiat, which um, don't say you do that if you do it, by the way, just for anyone who's listening. Um, that'd be a, an, an example of a proxy merchant. Um, there's, uh, uh, yeah, basically there, there's, uh, there's an endless, there's, there's basically anyone who, um, yeah, anyone who facilitates trade between the, the, the first and the second realm. And um, I guess uh, another, uh, uh, another, another, Example to provide here, and this this uh, this enables the proxy merchant role actually enables more um, of a permanent, more second, you know, permanent autonomous zone sort of uh, angle that, that we're talking about, and it, it is kind of a way of trying to have trying to have your cake and eat it too, you know, having the best of both worlds, and that um, you have uh, you know a semi permanent location, but that semi permanent location is not in your name, your name's not tied to the property, um, and you exercise whatever security culture principles you are able to and, and, and uh, you know need to. Um, to uh, I guess uh, you know remain invulnerable there, invulnerable there. So um, that's that's role of proxy merchant. You know, um, someone who might have the uh, the property in their name, um, they would handle the interaction with the coercers, the property, the property thefts, property taxes, um, any any um, any interactions with with coercers. They would be the the inter- they'd be the 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 uh, focus point for that, and uh, not you. Um, so. This could be someone that uh, you know just sees a financial, you know, sees a financial incentive for it, or it could be someone you know friendly of like mind that um, they've got a very, very, as you were saying earlier, squeaky, squeaky, squeaky clean reputation, 
um, and uh, if, if suspicion would ever fall on them, um, that they would have a very high likelihood of, uh, of getting out of it. Um, and that they would not roll over. That's a very, very important thing because yeah, a lot of people, um, when they're put in those situations, um, they uh, yeah, give in and uh, snitch, and that's not good. So, um, yeah, you've got, you've got to be very, very careful about who you choose to be your proxy merchant. Um, but uh, I guess that's, that's a, a, brief, a brief little overview there. Um, just uh, a way, another, another way to, 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 to uh, exist and uh, interact or, or, I guess, uh, not interact with the, second, with the, with the survival society. So essentially a buffer or a go-between between between the second and the first realm or between gray market and white market, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, Exactly. And that's something that we need more of or even what Ben Stone talked about, somebody between the above ground and the the Lego distribution network. You need that layer of separation. Right. You need that layer of separation. And we definitely need more of that. Now, have you read – you're familiar with Conkin's work, I assume, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, and, it's, it's been a few um, years, but yes, I'm familiar with, with Konkin, for sure. Well, Konkin, you know, being the sci-fi nerd he was, he, he extrapolated of what the four phases of the Agora would mm-hmm. look like. So you started out at zero, where, where there is very little underground economy, and then it builds up to where you have pockets of Agoras. And I think that's what Smuggler's kind of pointing at, is furthering along... Um, so he's combining the Taz with the Agora, and he's furthering along the concept of the underground economy and also adding on a social element to it. So yep. um, you're, you're, you're set, he's set, what's, what he's doing is creating an Agora, um, a, a small or an ethical enclave, as Rail put it. Yep. Um, and we're, we're furthering our, our evolution towards the society we want to see by doing it now. Okay, why don't we do? Why don't we um, quickly mention um, who is Smuggler and uh, what's sure. what's the Taz? I mean, people might have oh, heard sure, it. Yeah. Taz, Taz, Temporary Autonomous Zone. I, I never actually heard it pronounced out Taz, but yeah, why don't you go into that? Sure, sure. So um, I guess I'll, I'll first mention that uh, yeah. So second round book on strategy. If you're interested in this top in any of these topics, that's the book to go check out. It's available for free. On, for free. And um, we have it available for paperback as well via Libertarian Tech Publications. But um, yeah, second round book on strategy is uh, is a book by Smuggler and uh, X Y Z, obviously pseudonyms. Um, I've interviewed Smuggler on the Bonnie Podcast a few times, just as of, you know, just recently, as of a week, a week and a half ago, a couple weeks ago, whenever it was. Um, but uh, um, yeah, these are real. Uh, you know, these are real cypherpunks, um, real crypto anarchists, real people building you know real second realms out in um, over in Europe. There's actually uh, an, an institute of crypto anarchy in uh, in Prague. An actual physical location with nice. a Bitcoin logo on the side. They have hacker spaces there. They do all sorts of really, really awesome stuff there. And it's an idea that's kind of spreading. It's very much like the second realm, um, you know, what's, what's developing with homesteads here in the U.S. There's this more, um, it, it seems like, and I haven't been there, so this is just my, my perspective from, from over, you know, from across the pond. But it seems a lot more of theirs is happening in the cities. So um, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, def- definitely interesting. Definitely interesting. Um, but um, so um, that's... that's uh, um, Second round book on strategy and, uh, and, and smuggler, and as far as uh, temporary autonomous zones, um, really these are just uh, these are just uh, places where we can get to conduct trade and other activities, uh, including vices in certain areas at particular times without reprisal from the state. Um, so, um, yeah, originally temporary autonomous zones uh, were conceived of as as being geographically mobile, as we've, we've been talking about mobility here. Um, but now it may include cyberspace, um, such as the deep web. Um, so that's really, uh, that's really just, uh, you know, temporary autonomous zones, second realms. These are all very synonymous terms, um, but they, they can mean, they can mean a little, a little different things depending on the strategy. Um, so yeah, hopefully that provides a, a good enough introduction. Well, let me differentiate, um, say van nomadism and mobility versus a temporary autonomous zone. So when I listen to Smuggler and X Y X X X Y Z, mm-hmm. is that it? Yep. What's Frank Brom? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I don't. I don't. When know, I listen I don't to those two, Brom, I've been but, listening. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, those two guys with the German accents there. Um, yeah. <laughs> when I hear them talk about it, when they say temporary, and I think they're drawing from Hacking Bay quite a bit here, they don't necessarily mean you're moving every couple of weeks right. you just yep, have yep, yep. the ability that if something goes wrong you can pick up and be ghost in a matter of minutes and set up somewhere else yep. so the idea is to keep that place there as long as and autonomous as long as possible 
until it becomes no longer possible. Yep. And you're either either through having low capital in, uh, cost in, invested in it or it being very easy to move yep. one of those two things. You can just pick up and go in minutes and um, be somewhere else a thousand miles away and start all over again. So it's not like you're temporary in the sense that you're just moving it all the time for no reason. It just has the ability to be moved very quickly. Exactly. Okay, nice. Right. Exactly. Right. Well said. Yep. And I also highly recommend um, the episodes with Smuggler on on Vanu podcast. They're, they're very interesting. And also, if you want to learn more about the temporary autonomous zones, you have an audio book on your on your website. Is that correct? Of Hacking Bay. So the, there is an audio book for the temporary autonomous zone. Um, correct. That is should that is on right. the the Vanu podcast podcast feed. Um, yep. Correct. And I think actually, the I, second realm, I think I think the well. second round book is on the. Is, I think the second round book on strategy audiobook is is available for free on the podcast feed too. I, did, I, I was putting in all, I was putting most of our audiobooks out for free the past few months. So, um, yeah, check check out the Vonnie podcast uh, feed if you're uh, looking for uh, for for listens in this area. But yeah, I believe the um, the second realm book uh, audiobook sends you over to Audible. But yes, um, it is it is up also up on your website. Yeah. That, that's another good good read. Yeah. Um, both highly recommended. Um, so what, what then a permanent autonomous zone is essentially one where it's not able to move. Yeah. So what, what would be the, what would, in your opinion would be the, the benefits of, um, both? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, with, with, uh, permanent autonomous zones, obviously it's, it's really that kind of, uh, unless you have like a, a van nomad, you know, like gypsy caravan or something. Um, then you're, it's going to be really hard to build a culture, you know, build up, you know, resources and community, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, one of the, the main benefits, and, and this is what is, I think, attractive to so many people right now and, and has been in, in the anarchist and, and libertarian community for, for some time. That's why I've been going to freedom festivals for five or six years now, um, not longer. Um, it's that, uh, you know, um, getting together in, in physical space and time is, uh, is, 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 is definitely, um, definitely important. And uh, not only to do that, you know, every once in a while, more of a more of a temporary freedom festival type way, but um, more of a more of a permanent way, um, where uh, yeah, as, as you're saying, you can have some sort of some sort of stability, even if it's not permanent, permanent, even if it's only semi semi permanent. Um, but the idea is that you you can actually build up, um, you can actually build up on a property. You can actually um, instead of uh, you know living out of a van and not having much room for maybe storage or having to be very creative, and uh, you know have caches all over, um, you. You've got a lot more to work with. I mean, there's a lot more flexibility. I've got a lot more options, uh, like I was talking about earlier, um, here on the here on the homestead. Like I wouldn't be able to incubate ducks in a van or um, raise goats or lambs on in a van. Like that's just obviously not feasible. Well, okay, exceptions notwithstanding, I did see a really cool picture. The guy with an RV. He had a uh, like a, on the hitch thing in the back. Instead of like where you'd have coolers in there, he had an enclosed like. I guess enclosed cage with chickens in there, and they were driving around with them. So that's an exception. But generally right, that's speaking, cool. generally right. speaking, you're, you're going to have a hard time doing these those sorts of things. Um, so really, it just comes it just comes down to um, <clears throat> yeah, I, it, those those would kind of be the the, the the couple of things the the building up of uh, a community and resources and, and, and uh, capital on, on on that piece of property, and um, yeah, I guess those that be the, the the main advantages. Really, you, you've got a lot of ways to, to you've got a ways to, to lessen your dependency on the on the state and the servile society, um, in a more permanent fashion, rather than you know just being on the run all the time. Essentially, and, you know, on the run in quotes. You're not necessarily on the run, but um, if you move around a lot, I guess it could kind of seem like that. Possibly, I don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, when you're moving all the time, you don't have a chance to build up relationships yep. and, like you said, community ties. And, okay markets and that kind of thing it's much harder to do because you have to start all over each time you move and get to know people again and uh build up your capital once again etc 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 whereas a permanent uh situation gives you uh, much more longevity to to sell chickens to your neighbors or whatever the, whatever your situation is to where you can develop stronger community bonds which i think is also very beneficial in making you invulnerable or less vulnerable to the state as well. If you can sort of um, interact with each other versus uh, interacting with the state and their corporate cronies, then that's all for the better. You know? sure. Yeah, I like that. Um, and basically, uh, again, not just how you put it, um, it's basically the, you know, being the temporary lifestyle, whether you're uh, on the move all the time or, or ready, ready to roll on the move occasionally. 
um, that mobile lifestyle, you know, is basically hinders you from um, building up any capital, uh, just capital, regular physical capital, social capital. You, you know, it, it's 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 it all, it's all kind of it's all one it's all one thing. You cannot build the networks, and I think Seth really points out something good here that so for the um, the disadvantage disadvantages of the sedentarianism of you know versus the mobile lifestyle i think one thing you can do i mean it's this takes some effort for some people more than others is to build the networks to really build the networks to have good relations with people because i think that honestly that the human the the human social capital um that you invest in, in doing that could be what uh creates a lot of the invulnerability that count counters the vulnerability of like sedentarianism. Yeah. yeah. They both have um, kind of their ups and downs and, and, and pros and cons for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and statistically speaking, the less, so if you're trading with, uh, if, if you aren't trading at all, if you produce it yourself or if, as you're saying, you trade with a neighbor, you barter with a neighbor or something like that. Every time you remove yourself from a potential every time you remove yourself from the servile society and into more of a private you know agora or something like that that's one that's one less time that you expose yourself to possible coercion um so i i, I don't i can't prove this but um i, I would almost I, I i don't yeah i don't know um anyway um but yeah i i'm definitely with you i'm, I'm definitely with you that uh <laughs> Yeah, the, the more you can trade with each other, um, the better. And, and plus, you can barter. Um, you can barter. I, I went to, uh, I, I use the example, you said this a couple times in podcasts, but um, I go to a local butcher here, and um, I, uh, I feed my dog a raw carnivore diet. So um, I, uh, I usually go there and I get some meat for myself and, um, you know, get some, some raw butter and, and things of that nature. And, and I get her beef heart. And a lot of times they give me the beef heart for free because they obviously have a lot of it and a lot of people don't eat it. Um, so, like, you can't, like, is what's is Walmart? Walmart's not going to have beef heart, obviously, first off, and and they're not going to haggle with you or barter with you or give you a special discount because they they like you as a person or anything like that. So um, there's just so many advantages mm-hmm. to um, you know working you know working with um, people that you know, people that you trust. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and, it, and it's not so. It's obviously there's people that are going to have a, a you know a mutual interest and have a similar lifestyle. People that have an ideo- ideological bent, kind of an agorist ideological bent. To uh, to engage and trade and peaceful interactions and um, exchange with you in, in your preferred forms, but even outside of that, people that are not ideologically inclined, just 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 locals, just nice people. I mean, just building that those human relationships and human capital. Well, not only could could you you know to some people you know kind of have some kind of influence on them, kind of uh, change some of their opinions around, and, and just a lot of it through the actual exchange that you you um, perform with them, but they're less they're than a stronger link. Just having those social relationships, they're a stronger link. Um, you know, kind of insulating you from the state. They're less likely to stay to, to snitch. Mm-hmm. To, to, they 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 look, they're, they're like you. They're the little old lady down that runs the. Um, you know the the general store somewhere. You know if if you're nice and kind and you 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 do her a, a favor and she, you know you have a nice ongoing relationship, she's not going to uh, snitch on you versus you know someone who's an outs- outsider who's not trusted who's uh, you know seen as sus- suspicious or something. And it's, it's something as simple as that. Sure. Yeah, there's all sorts of possibilities on, on that line. Yeah, it's it's amazing a, one. another layer of insulation, really. I would rather deal with the community than um, and people I know and 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 trust than you know Walmart or the state or any other you know big uh, corporate agriculture or anything like that. And like you said, if you if you're going to buy beef hearts from this butcher and and feed it to your dog and you you, you talk to the guy a lot, he's not gonna. He's not going to narc on you, you know, <laughs> He's not, unless you're really doing something crazy um, to where I think this change starts to begin to change minds solely out of self-interest after a while um, about these these kind of things. You know, you're seeing a lot more interest in homesteading or uh, local farms or self-reliance, not because people think like we do or are anarchists. Mainly because they seem that see that these centralized systems just don't work. Yeah, they they would rather rely more on themselves and the community than the than the uh, the 
electric, uh, electric, electrical grid or Walmart or these big supply chains that fail every time somebody sneezes, you know? So people are moving this direction, I think, at least it seems that way, um, purely out of self-interest rather than uh, anything ideological. Yeah, I think that's something that we've really touched on in, in the podcast, I think, previously, and uh, something that, that we hold to be true, is is that, um, oh, I've lost my train of thought here, the, the, the Agora is um, it's kind of something that's yeah, devoid of the need for an, an ideology, really, and, and, and certainly an ideological period, it's not, a, it's not a movement, it's something that pe- it's something that's kind of self-perpetuating out of people's self-interest, and it, it solves a lot of the, um, I mean, when viewed from the standpoint of like a, a revolutionary praxis, it, it removes some. Of, it removes a lot of the uh, collective action problems and such, and organizational problems of organizing a party and organizing a you know a, a, a movement and such. And um, it, it's something that operates kind of uh, in a, in a perpetual motion based on just people's uh, self interest. And I, like I said, it's, it's does. It's I think it's there's a really really value in agorism in kind of being a self-perpetuating um, kind of idea in that form. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I, I'm right there with you. And I've said, I've said this, this similar thing on, on, on my podcast that uh, um, is, you definitely see a lot more people interested in, in, uh, in the realm of self-liberation. Um, but uh, I do think it's important to point out. Um, yeah, certainly the Agora is, is devoid of, uh, um, you know, it's uh, the, the Agora is some of all voluntary human inter- interactions. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really just, uh, you know, if people are voluntarily trading, I mean, that's, that's the Agora. It doesn't have to be anything beyond that. But, um, in terms of, uh, Agorism or even Vanu, I think, I think Honkin and Ray were very much in line here that, um, the, the, um, the conscious action, I guess you could say that, um, for example, in the Soviet Union, everyone was a counter economist, but not everyone was an Agorist. Um, and the idea is that, you know, when, right. whenever you pursue these, you know, Agorism or Vanu, you're doing it consciously that, um, you're, you're doing it, uh, because you, you think it's the right thing. You're, you're doing it because it's, it's, you know what? Whatever. There, there's a philosophical or ethical kind of thing to it. Like it's 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 uh, the combination of the philosophy and the action. Um, it's not just the action because you have to, the action because you need to, or, or because you want to. It's because um, there's something more to it, right? There's um, um, there's an elevation of consciousness per se um, that goes along with it. So um, I think that's why there's a really really good opportunity um, that's ahead of us here. There, there are more. There are definitely more folks interested. Um, but there's also another another the other angle here is that. Um, you know, um, it takes, uh, you know, it takes time to, I guess, deprogram and to, um, you know, adopt, uh, you know, the, the adopt uh, the ethical principle of non-coercion, as Rayo called it, um, to, you know, uh, to, uh, you know, forswore the use of coercion, per se. Um, so, um, I mean, there, there's, a, there's certainly a, a bring people into these, into these agoras, the ethical enclaves, um, but also, um, you know, uh, for example, here at the Free Republic of Pasnia, um, I had a, uh, an event last year called Vanu Fest 1. I had about 25, 30 self-liberators out here at the homestead. Um, and these are all people I've gone to freedom festivals with for five or so years, you know, five plus years. So like they're all vetted. I, I know all of them very, very well. So I invited all them out last year, and now I've got my first, you know, inner first layer of trust. And uh, now anyone who invites anyone outside of that, um, you know, it's on their ass, right? If uh, they invite somebody who ends up, you know, not not driving or whatever, um, it's their problem. But I've got my very, very solid, uh, you know, first circle of trust. So the the, the point here is that. Um, um, obviously, like we want to help these people as much as possible. We want to tell them about, uh, you know, um, the, the virtues of, of, of uh, you know, voluntary trade and all those things. But um, at the same time, we've got to exercise caution because the, the world out there is the way that it is. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's uh, what we're doing at our, at our second realms at our, at Pasnia, whatever, you want, at, uh, you know, the, um, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, we're trying to, uh, you know, build up an alternative um, and give people an, an option if they want to live in accordance with these principles, if they want to live free in the here and now. So, um, just, uh, I guess, one, one thing I'll, I'll point out. We talk about security culture a lot in the Vanu podcast. Um, See, so yeah, I, I just point out your listeners back in the direction of that again if they're interested uh, and, and really, really getting into the, the nitty gritty on these things. Yeah, security culture and vetting is very important. But um, on the other hand, and I don't remember where I heard this, but being ultra paranoid of Fed infiltration can very much destroy. Um, a circle of friends or, or, or a movement as well. So if you're not doing anything crazy, you know, you don't necessarily want to get hyped up wearing, you know, who the, who the fed is. But if you're, right. if you are, um, you know, doing something that you should be worried about, then yes, you want to be ultra vigilant about who the fed is, you know? Um, so yeah. you gotta have to, you have to weigh your, uh, 
your your risk versus reward there, you know. Uh, yeah, you have to do that in every situation, though, because there's a lot of a lot, a lot of situations. It depends on hey, what, what what's the nature of your exchange or what, what what's the nature of your actions. Um, there's there's interactions that are uh, uh you know, uh, agor- just to use the language of algorithm, um, ag- agorist, agorist on agorist, and then there's obviously lots of honor, um voluntary interaction that is um non agorist or non agorist, but there's also a lot of interactions that are agorist that agorist and non agorist and you know I mean, what's the nature of that exchange when and and you know you can tailor your your security your own personal security culture uh, your own um you know countermeasures to uh whatever threats you you, you just think, you just think rationally basically you 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 think rationally and take into consideration um the the risk involved mm-hmm. differently in every situation yeah, yeah, and, and and you make a good point. I guess the the last, the, I guess the last thing that comes to mind now is that you, what what does community what do uh, you know communities and relationships relations require? Um, well, they require trust. Um, and if you have a bunch of paranoid people that don't trust anybody, you're gonna have a hard time building a community. Um, and that's just that. So, um, you know, there's there's uh, there's 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 risks to everything. There's risks to everything. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, are we are we gonna just live in fear? Are we gonna try to try to build? Uh, you know, despite you know what's going on, I, I think, um, you know, it's uh. It's time to build. That's my my position at least. Okay, circling around now that we're talking about that, circling around to the uh, the the key New Hampshire situation. Um, I don't. I'm fairly familiar with um, you know uh, a lot of their activities up there. You know, I I, I was um, you know listening to the show on and off for a while, um, and, and enough to really get into the uh, kind of the ideas of, of, of their cryptocurrency activism. Um, in in New Hampshire, and, and oddly enough, I think they got it mostly direct, mostly almost entirely deregulated at the state level, which is um, unfortunately it's, it's the feds that really are going to come down on you on that kind of stuff. Um, but it, it, they had a lot of, uh, they actually did have a lot of businesses, real life brick and mortar businesses, and through like you know face to face interaction, accepting cryptocurrency. I don't know what they did beyond that, but they were they were they, they were convinced to. And had brick and mortar uh, businesses accepting cryptocurrency as payment and um, doing, you know, doing commerce in cryptocurrency. Do, and they're, they're obviously, you know, purely white market businesses. And, you know, then, then I, I, you see, um, and they're, but they're very open. They're very open. This is, this is loud, loud and open activism. And of course, you want it to be because it's supposed to be white market. Unfortunately, I mean, these, Activities that are going up there are really great market activities, and you know the 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 risk is now that um, what what, what I want to say is they were very very open, as in um, you know broadcasting nationally, internationally, and and all over the internet about um, what they were doing, and really they had a very loud voice um, because that was the that was their ministry. So you know I think you can you can do quite a Bit depending on the nature of what you're doing before you really get on the authorities' radar. Depending on obviously the, the kind of activities you're you're engaged in, of course. And I mean, nobody's except for you know actual illegalists are just going out and looking to to, to break laws. Laws are some things that tend laws and regulations tend to stand in between us and our, our, our desired goals and um, desired natures of exchanges, but. One thing I see is, you know, obviously this, these um, federal uh, indictments and raids are going to have a chilling effect on white market business, businesses kind of um, engaging in, you, you know, simple accepting uh, alternative forms of payment, which they, by default they were serving as, in, in bonded terms, um, what's the word again? The proxy proxy exchanges? Proxy mer- Essentially, proxy merchants. yeah. yeah it's a- proxy merchants, yeah. And they have the software and everything else. I mean, I mean, set up. It's very simple. I mean, cryptocurrency itself is, uh, you, you know, I, it, it takes a level of uh, of simplifying. It's it's very new technology. But I, you know, uh, and I'm af- I'm afraid, unfortunately, that kind of what was potentially a really good way to kind of to basically bring a lot of white market um, businesses into the uh, kind of proxy market realm to kind of um i mean white markets 
basic terminology, but kind of mixed agorist in, in, in Vaughn terms. You, you know, um, it was it was a really good idea because it would create by default um, proxy merchants uh, throughout the uh, throughout the white market in places where you, sometimes you just want to slice pizza. You know, I mean, it, it's that simple. And or you might want something you know more substantial, mm-hmm. and this this now has a really chilling effect in in the uh, use of cryptocurrency to kind of engage in exchanges out, outside of the uh, federal reserve notes. And you know, I mean, this you can't get away from the fact that that actions like this are designed to quote unquote send a message. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're 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 exactly right. Um, you're exactly right. It's uh, ch- chilling dissent, which is uh, you know what the what the state does, and um. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I don't really have too much to offer, too much else to offer in that. I guess, I guess I'll just say that um, I think there was there was another incident as far as Ian Freeman popping on the radar. I think this this is I don't think this is his first federal raid. I'm pretty sure there was one that happened in 2016 too, um, regarding something else. So this is yeah. not his first um, his first time popping up on the radar. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just um, mm, yeah, it's uh, it's as we've been talking about, it's uh, it's a trade off. It's a trade off, and unfortunately. Um, with uh, when we're talking about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, it's uh, you know kind of re- reminds me of uh, the situation of Ross Ulbricht and the Silk Road. That's uh, you know very like uh, what I, I guess uh, it depends on how far you want to get down the conspiratorial rabbit hole. But as far as um, you know drug running and, and such, well, the, the state has a very best interest in that. You can just look back at um, you know there's various case studies throughout history that the state has always had a very very heavy interest um, in the drug trade. So when the Silk Road opened, that's how up, that the was, CIA was formed. Yep. Yes. It, it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the so, opium wars. Yeah. So they're direct. So so Ross was directly challenging, um, you know that that massive, you know that massive, you know black budget, those massive black budget coffers or whatever, whatever, whatever color budget budget it is now. They might maybe they change it. I don't know. You know what I'm talking about. But um, so they was directly challenging um, the state in that way. And, and uh, you know with Bitcoin with cryptocurrency, um, yeah. I mean uh, the the stranglehold of the survival society really is the money. Um, I mean that's what the entire you know last year has been right. It kind of seems like it's just been uh, you know one of the major drivers of just you know pushing. Um, you know, pushing um, as much small business under as possible. Um, so it's um, that's the, the commerce is really the stranglehold. And if, if uh, people start moving towards decentralized and open source cryptocurrencies um, versus you know a, a centralized federal digital do- federal reserve digital dollar, I mean, um, yeah, that's it's, that's certainly a problem. Um, that's, that's certainly a problem. And uh, and uh, I, I guess that the, the positive way to look at this is they see a need. To do things like this, they see a need to do things like this because even though I think, uh, even though there's a lot of folks within this, within the government that have no understanding of this technology whatsoever, um, there are those that do, and um, you know there's a there's a reason that they're you know they're coming after it and they're coming after this technology. So um, yeah, it's unfortunate, but uh, you know this is this is the um, I, I mean, how many times has Ian been arrested over the past over the years? Obviously for less serious things than this, but um, you know like it, it's not. Um, this is this is the, the I guess so this is the fight that quote unquote you know a lot of us have chosen um, per se um, this is this fight for freedom so um, you know there's gonna be there's gonna be folks that go down unfortunately and hopefully when those situations come come about um, we've got uh, um, you know we, we've got uh, you know bi- uh, you know Bitcoin bill funds put together and things like that um, so that we can uh, uh, you know help out in whatever we, whatever we can and um, obviously heading these things off from the very beginning by exercising great security culture and um, you know. You know, building you know building these pockets of freedom in accordance with the second realm, and not just doing it as so brazenly um, challenging the state, and um, not only challenging the state, but take, trying to take over the state. You're talking about their their I guess their so-called success. Um, you know, within within the state of New Hampshire, I haven't followed it, so I, I don't know anything about it. But um, I mean, they've if they're having success in that area too. There's another challenge. So um, I mean, it's um, it's uh, yeah, unfortunate, but you know, Ray, Ray talked about this too back in the '60s that. Um, you know, Vanuans are more than happy to, um, you know, co, I guess, coexist with the state because, you know, like, what are, uh, I mean, like, uh, me or my small set of Vanuan friends, like, what are we going to, how are we going to fight the state, right? How are we going to fight the state ourselves? We're not going to. So, we're, that's not our goal. Our goal is to live free despite the existence of the state. Um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of the angle that I take, um, is that um, the the best that I can do anyway. To me, those is, two is concepts are one and the same, though. Yeah, to me, those two concepts are one and the same. So they're they're both. So you know, it's it's building a, a new society within the existing old society, or a new um, alternative structure or relationships, et cetera, et cetera. And I believe that that is actually um, 
it's taking the legs of the state out from underneath it. So in, in a way, it's like you go, you're benefiting yourself in the immediate, um, in the present by getting more freedom in your own life. But in the long run, you're slowly eroding what, uh, the power that the state stands on, essentially. Um, and I think we can learn a lot from, uh, from Ian Freeman and, and the guys up there to where we can apply the lessons learned there um, to our own security cultures. So if you're, you know, you and I, we both have homesteads. This, you know, the state may or may not think we're valuable enough targets to come after. So, um, you know, maybe we could be loud mouths on a podcast, right? But if you are actually doing something that, um, like getting the, your whole region um, set up with alternative currencies and running um, alternative currency ATMs and et cetera, et cetera, then maybe you shouldn't be shouting about it from the roof to rooftop. So you have to apply security culture is highly individual. You have to understand what your own risks for, um, and risk averse nature of yourself is. You have to understand what you're willing to, um, to put up with. Are you, are you ready to go to a cage? You know what I mean? Or maybe you can avoid going to a cage by not shouting about it on a radio show. Or if you're shouting about it on a radio show, um, maybe you have yourself a, a couple layers of, of buffer of go-betweens between you and these, you know, underground activities, you know? So it's, yeah. it's thinking about security and countermeasures, which is highly important because the more of us get locked in a cage, the worse off we all are. Right. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like we, yeah, not, there, we cannot war, win a war of attrition against the state. It's just not possible. Yeah, um, and, and a couple of things I want to say about that. Um, you, you know, I, I think they did some great. They've done some great work with cryptocurrency in, in general. I think outside of the cryptocurrency, we're going to kind of take some issues with their particular forms of activism. But you, you know, they they have made a, a lot of a lot of headway and. Um, in real life and uh, media uh, representation, representations very early on in the cryptocurrency realm. But, um, you know, they were very, very loud, very open. I, and I, I think that most people, you know, that's the, that's the first strike. Most people are going to be exercised some or a lot of security culture. Most people are not looking to be, you, just, you have a long way to get down to list of people that are actually maintaining the security culture that are not trying to put themselves out there. So one thing we can say is that, you know, there's not, there's, there's still some difficulty in, in kind of penetrating, uh, you know, even moderately secure, you know, networks of people. I mean, sure. There's a lot of federal informants out there. There's a lot of vulnerability. There's a lot of, um, surveillance, but I, I think that there's a lot that you can do as much as it seems that the, the, the surveillance is pervasive and that the, their tools are uh, unavoidable. I think that just, just the actual practical, you know, the, the practical um, limitations on kind of just even detecting and, you know, wanting to, ex to expend effort and resources and, and, and to, you, you know, it, it, it takes a lot to kind of penetrate a good network of um, libertarian or anti-authoritarian types that, ha that have, have some trust. It's just when that when that trust breaks down and when that security culture breaks down that uh, of a vulnerability is formed. Sure. Well, I, I don't remember if Smuggler talked about it on his own podcast or on yours, Shane, but he often talks about um, making, you know, infiltration or uh, a raid on you very costly. So, you know, state thugs, they work on incentives just like anybody else. And um, if you can make it so they don't gain very much by, you know, infiltrating your circle of friends or monitoring you and the, the, the cost of trying to do that is very costly and they don't gain anything from it, then chances are they're going to leave you alone. So that's another like obvious strategy to, to make yourself uh, less vulnerable to the state and, and others. Yeah, 
And also yeah. a type of camouflage. So when people are, are I just want to really quickly add, um, I don't know what you exactly what you would call this, but um, a type of camouflage when people are engaging in, you know, people of a like mind, of a kind of an agorist, um, a personal liberation, uh, a vanding mindset, that, that, that they would uh, communicate generally in um, encrypted communications and, and you in exchange generally in uh, encrypted in, uh, currencies, uh, cryptocurrencies, and in in general, uh, it generally, regardless of the nature of the activity and who, who it's with, uh, maintain their uh, best uh, security and kind of liberatory culture that allows you to um, a install this instill this as a culture, perhaps uh, slowly and judiciously spread the, the, this ne- these kind of networks, but also you know does it it obviously it creates more um more, more it, it camouflages and dilutes the um you know your vulnerabilities to to uh so-called authorities that they, they're all off if, if you're basically uh you know transmitting uh grandma's cookie recipe uh via encryption you know via you know encrypted hashes then it, it, you know, basically, they they can't uh, target you based on that. They can't. This this is too much to uh, try to try to go through, try to circumvent your security measures. Right, right. Yes, and 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 what we're talking about is talking about uh, you know blending in in uh, in some way, um, whether uh, I guess in the uh, in the in the mix of uh, encrypted communications or um, if we're talking more of a more of a physical sense. Um, kind of, uh, there's a, a low profile behavior um, practicing the gray man, which is, uh, I guess, another strategy element, another, I guess, security culture related related strategy. Um, but yeah, just low profile behavior in general, whether you're in, in whether you're in physical, you know, in a physical commercial area, or if um, you are, um, yeah, if you're uh, on, online, right? Um, and don't do things that are going to draw attention. Um, it goes without saying, you can do. I, I, it's I, I don't know, like I can't I can't prove prove this for sure, but um, I don't think I mean if you if you do things if you if you Cut your ties to the state, um, and uh, you, I guess, work on your security, work on your, I guess, digital secure, di- digital communication security culture. Um, you might be able, I mean, you, you might be able to, 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 to blend in very, very, um, you know, blend in nicely. I mean, if you look at the Survival Society right now, I mean, they've got they've got a lot on a lot of, a lot on their plate, um, trying to get all the, I guess, uh, I guess uh, they've got a lot on their plate. Um, so if we, yeah, as as you're saying, if we if we just um, Kind of uh, stay hidden under the radar, build up our you know off-grid homesteads with our our lambs and goats and chickens and all these things and our off-grid electricity and all these things and just um, you know just just do what we can. I mean that's that's what it comes down to. Um, we're, we're we're doing what we can and, and blending in as as best as we can. So yeah. Yeah, I mean as as an urban, I mean people might sometimes hear the, the, the sounds from the street coming uh, right outside my window, but as as an urban um, you know liberation-minded person. <clears throat> liberty-minded person and uh, person who cares about uh, personal liberation. I mean, the idea of, um, I, I, like you said, the, the quote-unquote gray man or, um, you know, just maintaining um, an, an anonymity and, and keeping a low profile in general and just uh, ideas of basic counter-surveillance and, and but more so not, not counter-surveillance, but just blending in and going about um, at, at your activities as fully as possible without uh, drawing attention to yourself and that those kind of tactics, um, that kind of strategy for a lifestyle, can really, um, I think, help the uh, urban, urban, uh, you said, von or you know, liberal minded person kind of go. And you know, I read, to, to be honest with you, uh, in, in, in my years, I've read a lot of a few, a few spy novels and, and stuff. I mean, and, and, and kind of the idea of you know just um, blending in, not bringing attention to yourself, and being um, very covert uh, in, in certain ways. Is um, I mean that's just uh, basic strategy, something you kind of pick up, and something you can pick up uh, from others. Well, that's something that applies out even in rural areas, or no matter what you're doing, it's it's to look like you're supposed to be where you are. Yes, so, yes, yeah. So if you're if you're moving pounds of weed, don't have a bunch of dead stickers on the back of your car. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like you you want to look you want to look like you're just any other person, just getting to work or whatever it is, and you're not up to anything. So like me, I live in rural Tennessee and I don't do this intentionally. It's not a, a thing, but you know, I have a family. I drive trucks. I shoot guns. I look like just any other redneck around here and nobody pays attention to me. The cops don't pay. Yeah. I haven't seen, 
I haven't talked to a cop in years. Do you know what I mean? Like nobody pays attention to me. I'm just some guy in work boots trying to get to work. So if you can think about things like that, like optics and, and trying to, uh, I don't want to say change who you are or conform to whatever, but just think about if you're trying to do something that, uh, some state actor might not like, maybe you want to think about blending in or looking like you're supposed to be where you are and you're not up to something. What is that? What does that person look like? And that's a very valuable strategy, I think. Yeah, I mean, really, it is something that might be kind of difficult to um, transmit how to do this intentionally. I mean, I mean, as, as a person in, in, a, in a more high-density high, high density area, and there, there are certain uh, vulnerabilities that you're going to run into living in a lower-density area because there's, there's, I mean, there's still going to be, frankly, a lot of cops in a lot of places and less uh, people for them to, uh, you know, keep an eye on. But let's just say in, in a high-density, in like an urban area, um, I, I, without making any particular effort, I mean, I've, I don't know what factors may go into this. I have very, very few interactions with uh, state agents, you know, especially the uh, security security apparatuses of the state. And I like to keep it that way. And um, I mean, yeah, it could be your choice of vehicle, your choice, your choice of clothing, your just your your choice of act. Because I mean, most of most of what you do is, is personally relevant. It is frankly done in in private and in in indoors and then it comes to, back to uh, circling back to what we talked about before a, a, a matter of trust a matter of uh, networks and social capital but I mean I it's definitely a, I, I really like that you brought that up Shane because that, I think that's that's very very important for us that um, and, and like you said sec, uh, sec, um, looking like you belong wherever you are and that's that's sometimes an acquired skill for sure and, and I guess if I could toss something out there, you, you made a really, really good point. And, and I've, the, the, the Bonnie publication I'm currently digitizing just happens to be Opting Out, Liberating Your Home. It's one of, artic- one of Rayo's articles. And uh, you made a really good point that a lot of the stuff that we do, like a lot of the stuff that we do, we need privacy is in our own homes, right? So the, the, what Rayo talked about is the, the first step um, to any, I guess, uh, any liberated lifestyle, any you know more secure lifestyle is to liberate your home first. And uh, he said the biggest and most important step to liberty is creation of a liberated home. A place out of sight, sound, and mind of others. A place where one may sleep and buy, love, build, grow children, and do anything peaceful in relative safety from the institutionalized criminals of state. So, yeah, you're, I mean, that's, that's, that's a good point. That's uh, definitely definitely worthy of, of bringing up. And, um, you know, as, uh, as, as Rayo laid out so, so well in, in so much detail, um, very, very important to, to, to make sure there's a one-directional isolation there, that um, you have access to the, to the, to the surveillance open but not free trading centers, but you do not allow them access to your Vanu, your Vanu home base, Vanu home base, or for him, plural, um, home base is plural, um, is better than just having one. So, um, yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of value in, in, in the conversation we're having today, and I, I love these these uh, these strategizing discussions. Um, need to happen more often. I'm, I'm very very pleased to, to I, I hadn't hadn't heard you guys' podcast before, so I'm definitely excited to check it out, and um, uh, definitely happy to toss it out to my listeners too because they're always. Um, there's not a lot of self liberational media out there, and there's definitely not of, of, of stuff strategizing in this realm, and it's very, very important. And uh, they're important discussions to have. So I want to just real, real quick, while it's on my mind, I want to, you know, um, you know, salute you guys for for what you're for what you're doing and and, and having this as interest at all. So, um, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I, and I'm really happy. That, yeah, we're pretty new. This is episode four, and you're only our second guest. So I thank you, thank you for coming on. Yeah, um, so I think we, um, very quickly, and I'm, I'm really happy about this, I got to all of our uh, topics and then still had a bunch more of stuff to talk about. And, and, and like you and Sex said, you know, you, could go out, you guys could go on for hours about any one of those topics. But I think as someone who, and I intentionally, I, I, I've read some, a few PDFs, I didn't really get that far into them. I intentionally didn't like go and listen to the podcast, learn about all the definitions. I really wanted to kind of cover this with our listeners because I think um, this is something that maybe if, I don't know if that many of our very small numbers so far of listeners really have heard of uh, Vanu. I know Sec is a big fan and um, it's definitely, but it's definitely well within the lines of the kind of stuff that we do and plan on talking about. And I think that in, and I, I hope to have you back on um, in, in the future, definitely for for more discussions of this. Um, second, I think this was a this was a great idea, and we definitely covered some really good content. 
Yeah, I think it was good. And um, again, thanks for coming on. And mm -hmm. I think you and I are at similar places in our, our paths here to where there's only so much you can argue about theory online or in person or there's only so before your your you know your blood pressure is really high and then uh you know you, you've not you, good at for some anybody. point if you're <laughs> interested in going to do something you have to figure out what what does that look like and what do we do you know and again these things are highly individual and it depends on what your own preferences are but um I, shane is a very solutions based uh, interested in solutions just as, as I am to where it's, it's like, okay, now where do we go from here? You know, I've read all the Rothbard and all the, you know, I've, I've read it all. I, now what do we do? You know, and, and that's where um, Shane's podcast kind of, kind of sits is he, he's focused on solutions and I've, I've, uh, I've always enjoyed, it's always interesting and I've always in, um, gathered a, a great deal of knowledge from his podcast, but I have one more question for you, Shane. Mm -hmm. Um, what did Konkin know of Rayo? Uh, great question. One I my, have to believe uh -huh. they knew each other, right? Yeah, one of my one of my favorite. They were in California for sure. Mm -hmm. What's yeah. that? Uh, I thought they were in California. But they were both in. I noted that they were definitely both in California for sure and around the same time. So yeah, that is a good question. So um, I actually just uh, this is new on the Vani podcast uh, podcast feeds. I guess uh, you know very good timing. Uh, just released uh, what I call the Vani Beginner's Guide. And I talk about this a little bit in there. But uh, yeah, so it was in November 1965 when Samuel Edward Conkin III would have been 18 years old. Rhea published an article in Innovator titled Self-Seeking Ethical Enclave Black Markets. So this is his definition, what he put forth. Uh, you can find it in his first book, Finding the Search for Personal Freedom. Quote, voluntary transactions between individuals who are living under a collectivist government when such transactions are conducted independent of that government. Ethical denotes the distinguishing characteristic of the participating individuals. An adherence to the ethical principle of voluntarism and enclave denotes physical immersion within a philosophically alien society. End quote. So he's talking about he's talking about you know gray and black market trading and, and the, the difference between uh, you know the, the ethical enclave and um, you know the, the open but not free trading centers and the serval society. Well, it's the fact that the, the, the aura is the sum of all voluntary human interactions. That ethical principle of voluntarism. So he pointed that out when Hawkins was 18 years old. Says, and so I, I call ethical enclave trading the precursor to agorism. Um, and uh, just one one other uh, excerpt from his article on this, just a point to, to I guess make the make the connection very blatant. Um, quote: An ethical enclave by existing within the in, within the territorial domain of a coercive government is either legal, utilizing interstices, which would be I'd, I'd say more gray markets, um, and the taxes and regulations of that government, or illegal, operating despite threats of violence. So he points out. I mean, he makes a distinction between black and gray markets too, but he isn't say it explicitly um so that is so the, the thing I, I found out about this i guess in 2017 2018 and um i guess the the only thing is as you said well was Konkin familiar with rayo did he know that rayo you know existed did he know about about the nuance you know about bond well yes had uh, to have. i have to believe he had to have. yes he he did and so, um, I, I wrote an article on this a uh, few years back um it is titled i'm getting it open right now um but um yeah it's a uh, um uh, it's a uh, if you search for Konkin on the Devani podcast website, it'll pop up. Um, but uh, there's a, another uh, the post I, I have up now is uh, Samuel Konkin III's writings discussing Rayo and Vanu. And there's actually um, four articles I found um, that were published in the Southern Libertarian Review from January to June 1975. Um, and they're not all positive. You know, Konkin didn't have all positive things to say about uh, about Vanu and Rayo. Um, I think his his, uh, um, his his complaints are valid, just like I think Rayo's are. are Kind of one of some of the most valid ones I've, I've heard against anarcho capitalism. Um, very valid, very valid criticisms. Um, and uh, but, but yeah, Hawking was familiar with Rayo, and um, it's my belief with uh, you know I guess the evidence I laid forth in that article that uh, yeah Hawking was familiar with Rayo, and I definitely think that he got some inspiration from from Rayo um, in his formulation of uh, of uh, agorism. So um, yeah, he's definitely familiar, and I guess I'll point out just for for the sake of your audience that. Um, the only real differences between agorism and um, ethical enclave trading is that ethical enclave trading is just an option for Benuans to pursue. Um, whereas if you're an agorist and you are not trading in the black and gray markets, you just aren't an agorist, unfortunately. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the, the only difference, and uh, one of the only ones. And the, the other one is that, as I said earlier, Benuans are happy to coexist with the state for the reasons I, I laid out before. Um, whereas, um, as we talked about earlier, Konkin's strategy is more like um, this is a revolutionary strategy, mostly, right? Of course, of course. Um, so yeah, those are the only real couple of differences. 
Yeah, I, I quickly um, kind of gathered that even when I was um, kind of kind of uh, teasing that we'd be recording and we'd be having a guest coming up for our fourth episode. That um, the, the one thing I did, and I, I obviously did pick it some uh, some basic material, getting a small part of the way through that, is that this was a stra- strategy first and foremost of personal liberation. And obviously, um, algorithm ag- or agorism has a uh, has a little bit different uh, goal and a little bit different take and, and, and does have some sort of ideological underpinning that kind of draw from more of a more of a political philosophy than than one of uh, purely of personal strategy and personal uh, liberation and I think that's a good thing and the value of that is that they're not basically trying to restate the same thing there's no it's not as much redundancy or like um, you, you know, they're, they're both they both can be very valuable independently from what one another of, and, of course and, and, and I'm, I'm sure i'm certainly not taking it away with anything away from Konkin. i'm just really into libertarian history and like digitizing these old public these old bonnie publications so i always just i, I kind of nerd out when it comes to this stuff so it's not i love yeah, and i love agoras and like there's not a competition here these are freedom strategies for liberation right. like this, this is not a competition yeah and actually um and you said you said that was 65 um, how long it was was way of writing because uh, 65 is pretty early from some of the stuff and i'm i'm certainly not super well read in all the uh arcane writings of the you know the 20th century american libertarian movement but um i, I find it super interesting um yeah 65 is pretty early it's from what i understand yeah yeah it is um so he started writing i think it was 1962 or 1963 um and uh and okay. i think it's his publication called innovator um and uh yeah i mean there's there's just uh it's it's crazy the um yeah the the, the foresight he had um looking back there's a really inc- a really incredible quote um and uh I'll, I'll pull it up real quick but i mean you look at the foresight this was like 19 this is in the 1960s but uh you know like last year with uh the technocracies you know really come full full you know i guess uh, you know right to the, the forefront well, uh, listen to what Rayo had to say, and uh, the, I don't know if it was like 1969 or 1970, but regardless, the 1960s or 70s, he said, quote, I want a lifestyle which can easily withstand the worst technocratic super-totalitarianism that is within the realm of reasonable possibility. We may still have some contact with that society. We won't have to worry appreciably over what idiotic thing the people molesters do next, any more than somebody who takes a vacation at the Riviera now and then needs to be much concerned about the politics of France. Our change in lifestyle will be, in a sense, will will be, in a sense, an answer to the omnipotence of state line of Rothbard and Hess. We'll answer not only in words, but by doing the only real way, end quote. So um, that's, that's a, a, good, a good quote. I wanted to make sure to slide in there. But um, yeah, he was, he was definitely ahead of the ball, um, ahead of the game, for sure. Um, and uh, I, keep, I keep learning about, I guess I keep coming across those things, um, and uh, I guess in, in, in reading these publications, so digitizing them. Um, so yeah, for, for your audience, I would definitely recommend go to VonniePodcast.com if you're interested at all in this. Um, there's a tab at the top of the page that says free Vonnie books. Um, Rayo's first book and his second book are both there, um, uh, free in PDF as well as an audiobook format. And uh, you can find a bunch of other publications there. And if you're interested in, in uh, you know, paperback copies of those you don't like reading on screens, we do make those available at LibertarianTech.com. Um, but again, like all the stuff is abil- available for free. We don't put anything behind a paywall. Um, but yeah, people want to support my work or if they want, uh, or if they like physical copies like I do. Um, we uh, we make those available. So, um, yeah. Anyway. Awesome, awesome. Looks like you want to add something as we close out. I think it's a good time to wrap it up. Uh, pretty much covered um, uh, some some uh, basic topics that we wanted to very um, you know, very completely. Uh, yeah, I heard that quote the other day on the, on your podcast, and I thought that was just way way ahead of the curve. And we sit at a time uh, in history where we're very fortunate to be able to look back at, you know, hundreds of years of anarchist thought on strategy and, and philosophy to where you can you can see the progression and everybody adds a little bit to it. You know, so you start way back at in the, the 1800s and you start working your way up here and, you know, you, this one person comes up with this idea and then Vanu comes, you know, and moves, moves the ball further and Dokken moves the ball further and then Smuggler moves the ball even further. And it's really, we're really fortunate to be able to see the progression and the, um, the addition to these ideas and these strategies. And, and it's, it, I nerd out on it too. I'm not going to lie, mm-hmm. but, um, I think that was it on, on my end. Shane, thanks for coming on. Um, I, again, I, I can't recommend the Vanu podcast enough. I've, I've been listening to 
to it since way back when it was still Liberty Under Attack podcast, or before you even uh, just switched over to Vanu. And um, so I, I highly recommend, I really think you guys would find it very interesting. And um, um, all the books on there are, are also very great. And um, I, I hope we can do this again because we can absolutely kind of delve into these topics and strategies a lot more. Mm-hmm. Um, more in depth but um again uh shane thanks for coming on uh if you want to anything else you want to plug before we wrap it up um yeah i guess uh for for folks who are are interested in uh, these sort of uh you know physical intentional community um you know offer intentional community projects um i have uh what i what i call here the free republic of pasnia Um, the website's pasnia.com p-a-z-n-i-a.com uh obviously pas is uh, short for permanent autonomous zone as well as being uh, peace in spanish um that was a very appropriate name so yeah, what we're we're doing here, we're, we've got a three stage plan laid out there. We're, we're working towards an off grid intentional community, um, and uh, I guess the the the, new, the country, I guess the new country project is kind of a culture jamming thing to, to toss on top of it. Um, if people go to the website, they'll see what I'm talking about there. Um, it's uh, yeah, some comical stuff if I do say so myself, but I was the one that did it. So. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, we've got a lot of stuff there. As I said, working towards food self sufficiency, and um, here actually in just about uh, um, here for I guess the last weekend in March, we're having our, our first our first uh, event here at Paz. And you're gonna have another 20, 30 people here um, for an unofficial unofficial camping weekend, and then Vani Fest too will happen at the end of the year. So if any of your audience is interested in coming out to um, you know one of these physical second realms to experience the culture, the um, the uh, the agora, all those things, um, well, I've got to know you first off, or we have to know someone in common that that can uh, that can vouch for you. So if, if that if that doesn't happen, if that's not the, the case now. Um, then do, do uh, you'll, you can find uh, the Telegram uh, Pasnia uh, chats um, there at, uh, at Pasnia.com and uh, get in there, build your reputation, and um, maybe you'll, you'll get an invite at some, at, at, at some point, hopefully. Uh, but yeah, build up that reputation. And, uh, and, 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 and yeah, so uh, Pasnia.com, Libertarianattack.com for, for uh, you know, books on self-liberation. Um, and uh, yeah, BonniePodcast.com for you know, more self-liberational media. So, and with that, guys, I, I really appreciate you guys coming on. And as I said, I'm really, really happy to see uh, another podcast focused on, I guess, uh, even talking about solutions. So, uh, um, yeah, very, very happy. Um, happy to see, and uh, I'll be tuning in myself. I got one more quick question for you, Shane. What are you doing about energy on your on your off grid homestead? Are you doing solar? <laughs> uh, it's a good good question. Um, it's a yeah, good question. Um, so, solar is obviously an option. Um, solar is an option, but right. I'm looking uh, looking a little beyond that now. There's, uh, um, <laughs> I guess, uh, I've, I've kind of in the past year been looking into a uh, breakthrough energy sort of stuff. Um, and, uh, no, it's all theoretical now. I'm still looking into it, but there, there seems to be some, it does, doesn't seem, it seems like there's not only like one option, it seems like there's multiple. So, um, I'll kind of just, just hint towards that right now. I guess you could say more, uh, um, more kind of in the, in the realm of, uh, maybe Tesla like technology, but, um, for, for those who are familiar, but I'm looking into it. At Whoa. Least. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's okay. a lot of interesting stuff. There's Very a lot cool. of interesting stuff I want to, I want to know there. more about that, but. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that's yep. always the question, right? Is if you're going off grid, it's like, what are you going to do about about energy? And obviously, the solar is the you know uh, probably the easiest choice. But um, so I'll I'll, I'll, I'll I'll drop you one one teaser. So there's a guy named Walter Russell back in the 1960s, um, and uh, he was a uh, he was a uh, I guess a, a physicist and uh, artist. Also, also he was a Renaissance man, as far as I've been able to find out. But um, he uh, he had a working prototype for um, for a for energy device, a powered an entire uni- entire 52 year room university for. Um, for uh, an entire month, and the only input I think the, the only input was like warm water. And uh, then in the 1990s, Stanley Meyer, who um, came up with the hydrogen car technology, who ended up dead. Um, again, if you challenge him in any of these areas, you're going to face problems. Whether it's electricity, um, whether it's a centralized uh, electricity grid, whether it's you know their their uh, you know big pharma. Um, yeah, I've, I'm pretty sure from what I've found, Stanley Meyer is utilizing the same technology only in cars. So I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of options out there for this stuff. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd just certainly recommend folks. Uh, Think outside the bookends. Um, there's a, a lot. Of, there's a lot out there that is worthy of investigation, and that could be very worthwhile and, and, and liberation as well. So there's there's an overlap there. Just try not to end up dead. You know. Just yeah. Don't don't. Yeah. Try don't not to don't end talk, up with talk uh, about it. death by suicide by the two shooting shots in the back of the head or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Watch those patents. All right. Well, all right. Did you have anything else to add, sir? No. That's that'd be it. Uh, I'll sign off and everybody be excellent to each other. Our strategy for liberty is the creation of a culture of liberty, a society that occupies its own protected space 
and implements independent systems of cooperation. We need to create a second realm. Device connection terminated.